All right, hello. Well, in this video, uh, we're going to look at snowdrifts, uh, specifically looking at the case of uh, snowdrifts on uh, structures, flat roof structures with two different roof elevations, or with two structures that are of different flat roof heights uh, that are close together, abutting each other, uh, close together, etc. Now, again, in the previous video, we explored uh, basic uh, snow load calculations, including the calculating the snow load on uh, flat roofs and calculating the snow load on uh, roofs of uniform slopes. So before we continue, before we look at the uh, method of, uh, before we like actually look at the method of calculating um, snow load on uh, snow uh, snow load from drifts, we let's first consider the problem at hand and make a couple definitions. So let's say you have two roofs a lower roof and an upper roof. So we have an upper roof and a lower roof. And then um, let's say we also have the wind going in this direction. So you will have some snow load that applies evenly across the entire surface uh, that we, or at least we can model as applying evenly across the entire surface. And we uh, refer to that as our uniform snow load or our flat roof snow load or our balanced snow load. Uh, the roof, flat roof snow load, balanced snow load, those terms are uh, largely interchangeable in this context. Uh, however, if you've lived in an environment with a lot of snow before, you'll know that, uh, especially in any uh, storm situation, uh, snow is light. It's, uh, it's light, it's fluffy, it tends to move around, and so snow will tend to be driven by the wind. And anytime you have something being driven by the wind, it will tend to pile up in certain locations. So while you may have um, uniform load or a uniform snow depth on top of your roof, uh, there are certain locations that tend to get uh, drifts building up. And one of these, if I want to just, oh, I guess I'll go ahead and put that there. One of those is uh, on the lower roof surface or a lower roof abuts an upper roof. And if the wind is going this way, you get kind of, you get a roof or you get a, uh, you get a drift formation that's kind of like this, a little bit like that approximately. And we refer to this with the wind uh, approaching towards the upper roof, we refer to this as a windward drift. And then we also have the opposite situation where the wind is coming from the other way. So if we have an upper roof like this and a lower roof down here, we have upper uh, roof and a lower roof with the wind uh, still coming in the same direction. But basically in this one, the wind is piling up the wind or piling up the snow against the upper uh, roof uh, ledge basically. And when it's coming, and in this way, when in, in the uh, in this case, the wind is blowing snow off of the upper roof onto the lower roof, and we refer to this one actually. And the shape this tends to form is something more like this, and we refer to this type of drift as a leeward drift. <clears throat> so I will want to keep these in mind uh, again. A, uh, a windward drift is one where the, uh, the wind is coming towards the upper roof, uh, towards, so I'll just, I think I'll just leave this here as I work through my uh, notes, uh, windward, so it's towards the upper roof, and then leeward is away, is away from upper roof. And I will just leave that there as a note to us as we go along. And the reason I'm making the point to define these is that there are different provisions within the ASC 7 uh, to handle this. Uh, basically, the, the general method we're going to use is we're going to calculate uh, a model drift for, for a given location. See, here's the complication. Wind, of course, can come from any direction. So uh, as I have it here with the wind going this direction, this setup here <clears throat> forms a a windward drift. However, if the wind comes from the other direction, 
then the same exact physical setup <clears throat> will be setting up a leeward drift. So um, for one location, we'll calculate a model drift based on a uh, windward condition and a leeward condition. And then uh, and that basically models the flipping of the wind uh, direction. We'll essentially calculate one case for the windward drift, another case for the leeward drift, and then, our, then in our design process when calculating our load combinations and such, we will simply use uh, the worst case of the two. All right, so I just wanted to be clear right as we begin uh, the definition of leeward drifts and windward drifts. Make sure you write this down and really keep this in mind. Maybe pause the video and draw this out so you can really keep this in your head, what leeward means and what windward means in this context. And then we will go and actually start looking at some of the ASCE provisions. All right, so I think I need to clean off the board. So let's use a little magic and clean off the board. We, of course, spare no expense here on our special effects budget. Anyway, okay, so uh, next I want to look at some of the geometries involved. And so I want to, I'm going to lay out a few terms and we're going to reference these terms, these variables and dimensions as we work through these. So I'm laying out the geometry that is laid out in ASC 7. And you can find this in there. Of course, uh, I've kind of broken their diagram into two to make things a little bit more, uh, a little more visible in my mind, uh, a little more understandable. I'm going to have one diagram that represents the actual physical geometry of the situation with all the variables labeled. And then I'm going to have another diagram uh, representing sort of the uh, actual final load diagram. So, and this diagram will be common between both the windward and leeward uh, drift case. So let's first look at the geometry. So um, even though the shape between uh, windward and leeward uh, drifts is slightly different, we're going to approximate both of them as a triangle. So we have our upper roof here and our lower roof here. And we're going to label a few things. We need to label a bunch of dimensions. So first of all, let's go ahead and label, actually go ahead and use a different color. Maybe this will make things a little bit clearer, although the colors do tend to blend together in this, on this light board here. So uh, first I want to draw a couple things. I guess that's visible enough. So we have this line here, which represents the uniform uh, snow load that was applied across the entire uh, flat surface of the roof. And then we have a triangular portion that represents the additional load. Uh, and this is really our drift model. So we have this uh, line here, this zone here. Again, that represents the, uh, the snow that is uniformly applied across the entire lower roof. And then we have this additional triangular uh, region that represents the additional snow load that what is referred to in the specification as the surcharge that comes from additional snow that's piled on top of the uh, flat roof snow. All right, let's go ahead and label some dimensions. So the first thing I need to define is the height of the uniform uh, drift, or sorry, the uniform snow load case. And this is what we learned to calculate in the previous video. And the variable for this uh, that we're going to refer to, uh, it, we're going to refer to this dimension as H sub B. And the code again refers to this as the balanced snow load. Um, there are provisions in the ASC 7 for unbalanced snow load that we haven't really considered. Um, but I may have, if I have time, I may put together a video on those. But um, the flat roof snow load and the uniform snow load in this context are the same. So HB refers to balanced snow load. It just means the uniform snow load applied to a flat roof. Then um, let's see what else we're going to have. And so we're going to reference a couple dimensions off of that. First, we're going to have a dimension from the top of the uniform snow load to the uh, upper roof, and that's going to be HC. HC again is a, is a is the distance from the upper roof to the top of the uniform uh, snow load, and then we have HD, which uh, does not in this context mean high definition. It means the height of the drift. So we have three heights: HB, HC, and HD. HB is the balanced snow load depth or height. HC is the height from the uniform snow load to the to the upper roof uh, dimension, 
proper roof surface. And then HD is uh, the actual, uh, HD is the drift height that we're going to have to calculate. Now, a couple other things. Uh, HC, there are some, I am I am modeling this upper building as a, for simplicity's sake, I'm modeling it as just a simple, perfect rectangle. But there are some provisions about like how you actually define that. And I would encourage you to look that up in the ASC7, uh, simply because there are some cases where you know, you have parapets or you have complex geometries at the top of flat roofs, and it can become difficult to define what exactly the the uh, elevation of that roof is. So do uh, be sure to check that out as we uh, as you work through this. Okay, some other dimensions. We have our dimension W, and this is simply going to be the width of our uh, snowdrift, and that's going to have to be something we calculate. And let's see, and then a couple other things. We're going to have L sub U, which is the length of the upper roof. L is for length, U is for upper. And then we have another dimension, which the code doesn't label, but it does reference a few times. It doesn't give it a variable. So I'm just going to call this uh, lower roof length. There are a few provisions where this comes into play but they're not for, uh, there's not a specific variable for them. So, uh, but we will need to have that dimension um, before we can finish our snow drift calculations. So again, we have our width, we have all of our key heights, we have, uh, well, we have our uh, lengths. Okay, thinking back to design, uh, what, which of these do we have and which of these do we want to actually find? Before we calculate uh, snow load, before we calculate our snow drift load, for example, well, again, our first step is going to be to get our uniform load like we did in the previous video. But then when we start looking at drifts, we will have that. And we'll also sh we also should have the geometry of the roof itself. So we'll know the lower roof length, we'll know the upper roof length, um, and we'll know HC, because that's just the, distance, the difference between the height of the depth of the, uh, of the uh, uniform snow load to the upper roof. But we don't, so what we're ultimately looking for is we're looking for this, we're gonna have to calculate this, and we're going to have to calculate this. So everything else is, you ha you largely have, well, HB you have to do a little calculation for, but basically you have everything except HD and W when you're calculating your, um, uh, your snowdrift, you're going through your snowdrift calculations. So our work here is really going to be to find HD and W, and then based on this assumed triangular geometry, it's going to be very easy to calculate a uh, an actual load um, once we know once we calculate density and some other things. Okay, so that is our geometry map, and then we're also going to have a load map uh, that just has a few things. And this is going to be fairly straightforward, but just a few things that we want to keep in mind. So we have geometry and we have load. Actually, there shouldn't be axes there. So let's say we have, and again, we're only considering drifting for upper roofs, uh, or sorry, for lower roofs. Upper roofs don't tend to accumulate large drifts on them. Uh, and if anything, the difference in geometry will tend to reduce the net snow load on them because the snow can fall off of them. But with lower roofs where they intercept uh, or, or intersect with upper roofs, that is a place where you can get a load buildup, an excess of load. So what the actual load is gonna look like is we're going to have a uniform load applied along all along the uh, lower roof. And that value is P sub F. And that's exactly what we calculated in the previous, uh, in the previous video. That again is the uh, flat uh, roof snow load. And while it looks like this is a linear load, uh, keep in mind all of this is going into the page or into the board in this case. So this is actually a value in PSF. If I wanted to get this as a pounds per foot along this dimension here, I would have to multiply by the uh, dimension that this roof goes into the board or into the page. So we have our uniform load and then over part of the lower roof, we're going to have an additional load. And this is going to start from zero and linearly increase up to a value of PD, P sub D. 
which stands for the distributed load of a drift. Um, it's, and this is also in PSF. So again, if we wanted to get this as a linear load W along the length of the roof, we would multiply by the dimension that this goes into the board. So we're gonna be calculating loads, but these are all going to be in terms of PSF. And that is just something we need to keep in mind. I would encourage you to write these down if you haven't already, because I will be referencing these continuously as we work through uh, the uh, various steps of uh, calculating snowdrift load. And I will again use my uh, oh so wonderfully rendered magical powers to clean the board. Wasn't that great? Anyway, I'm not getting any uh, jobs in film edit editing anytime soon. Okay, it's a good thing I can pretend to do some engineering. So we're going to now uh, label and walk through the various steps involved in drift load calculation. Again, I'm not going to work through a full example in this video. I'm just going formally through all the steps. And then in a follow-up video, I will be working through a longer form of example of uh, snow and drift load calculations. So our first step, let's adjust this. All right, so our first step is going to be to calculate our snow uh, specific gravity, which uh, the, um, which the ASC7 labels as density, but technically that's incorrect. Well, it depends what, how, what definition you're using. So I don't like the term density for what they're using. I prefer specific gravity, but that's just me being pedantic. See, um, the actual value we're calculating is a force per uh, unit volume, um, but density, of course, if you remember basic fluid mechanics is mass per unit volume. So I'm gonna call it specific gravity. The ASC7 calls it density because I don't know, reasons, something, something, okay. So here's the thing about snow. The thing about snow is it's fluffy. I don't know if you're familiar with snow, but uh, if you're designing buildings in anywhere that are going to have snow drifts, you probably have seen snow at some point in your life. Um, and the thing about snow, again, is it's fluffy. And because of that, it doesn't have a set volume. Water is like, think about water. Water is nice because it takes up a set volume. In other words, if you have I mean, there are very slight, you know, changes in water's density uh, with temperature, you know, also sl slight changes in density with salinity, probably more salinity than with temperature. But like, if you were to measure, if you could precisely measure the volume of a kilogram of water as you raise it from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, you would find that the volume slightly increased. But it's so small in most like engineering design contexts we can completely ignore it, um, unless you're doing some sort of very precise uh, thermodynamic calculations or some very precise, um, I don't know, uh, engine calculations or something. Uh, and that's probably outside the realm of civil anyway. In most cases, you can consider the volume of water to be relatively constant um, with changes in temperature. But with snow, there's a lot of, th and same thing with pressure. I mean, if you, uh, in terms of pressure, if you pressurize water, the, the actual density doesn't change that much. In fact, you can model water as having essentially a constant density, regardless of how much pressure you apply to it up until the point where it turns into a solid or something. Um, yeah, in fact, like as you compress water more and more and more, uh, it doesn't tend to actually ever really start compressing substantially. However, at a certain point, it will turn into a solid under incredible pressure, even at room temperatures and higher. There's a lot of exotic forms of ices you can look up and such. but Snow is a little different because think about the structure of a snowflake. Oh man, I am not gonna be able to be able to draw this properly. So here is a crudely, incredibly crudely drawn snowflake that looks like an asterisk. Oh my God, this is bad. Okay, so say so you have, think about a snowflake. You know what a snowflake looks like. I should probably just uh, cut one out of a piece of paper like a second grader or something. I should probably mock kindergarten. My drawings actually look like they're made by a kindergartner, don't they? Anyway, um, so think about a snowflake. It's a complex crystal. Now that's fine and pretty and everything, but what happens when you stack a bunch of these together? They don't line up perfectly. The nice thing about water molecules is they like to be close together. You know, molecules of liquid water, I should say, they like to be close together, so they pack very efficiently. But these, you're going to get snowflakes, if you like, just imagine the, uh, uh, approximating each one as a line, approximate this whole thing as a single line. You can think of one snowflake just piling up in random orientations to others. And so they don't really 
when light snow falls and it starts accumulating on a surface, they don't pack very efficiently. However, over time, they can tend to consolidate and form denser snow piles. In other words, as the, for example, as the, as the snow gets deeper, the bottom layers tend to compact more under the weight. Or if a lot, if the, if the uh, snow undergoes temperature changes, it will tend to sort of eventually kind of coalesce into ice. Um, that kind of thing can happen very commonly too. And so if you've lived in a wintry climate, I grew up in Iowa myself. So if you've um, lived in an environment with snow, like substantial snowfalls in the winter, you'll know that snow is not of uniform density. Even when it falls from the, even when it falls from the air, uh, just depending on the temperature and pressure and humidity and a thousand different other variables, uh, like, half, like, more, like half dozen maybe, <laughs> but depending on many variables, uh, as snow falls uh, to the ground, the actual resulting snowdrifts can be of radically different density. Like you'll hear people refer to wet snow or dry snow based on its density. Like the, you heard, you've probably heard the old adage about, you know, uh, uh, like the Inuit language having a hundred words for snow or something like that. And the reason that can happen, the reason you can have a language like that is, be is simply because there are a lot of different ways snow can fall on the ground and its density can vary substantially. So now here's the problem from, structure, from a structural engineering perspective. Uh, what we ultimately care about is the weight and because uh, that's what's ultimately going to be loading our structures. And so how do we consider, like considering all the different ways that snow can fall on a building, how in the world do we consider that? Well, turns out uh, there, a lot of research has gone into this and the, what the ASC 7 has done is adopt sort of a reasonable upper bound limit. So it's probably modeled on a, a very wet, heavy snow uh, that you're assuming to fall. And so they, uh, they don't use a constant value for the density. Rather, what they do is they have an upper bound or have a value uh, based on the assumed um, le uh, level of uh, balanced snow load or the PG, the uh, base ground level snow load. Okay, so our first step again is going to be calculate the specific gravity of the snow. And our formula for this is going to be gamma equals 0 0.13 times PG uh, plus 14. And this is then less than or equal to 30 uh, PSF, or sorry, pounds per cubic foot, not pounds per square foot. So pounds per cubic foot. So note here, we are not using the flat roof snow load for this. We're using PG not PF. And remember what this is. This PG represents the snow that is falling on basically like a flat, on a flat earth or flat ground at a certain elevation. So in other words, if you have a building, these aren't two different roofs. These are, this is a, the ground and a flat roof building. You, you could essentially approximate this by saying you have that uh, just on an open field, empty ground, you would get PG falling down on the ground and you would get that PF approximately on the roof. So this PG value, that's just what you look up in the table. That's, that's the base table value without considering any kind of modifications for uh, roof geometry, for building temperature, surface roughness, anything like that. Uh, the assumed specific gravity for our snowdrift is going to be based solely on the uh, PG value, which you get directly from uh, the previously cited tables and um, US maps. Okay, so that's our first step. We're, we're going to calculate the, uh, a specific gravity for our snow. Now, once we have that, our next step is going to be to determine the balanced snow load depth. Determine balanced snow load depth. This again is the flat roof snow load. Because if you remember back to the previous drawing, like, or if you remember back to the previous drawing, yeah, we didn't actually have the, uh, if you think about what we calculated, I should say, if you think back to the previous video, at no point did we actually calculate the depth of the uh, balanced snow load or the flat roof snow load. Instead, we calculated a weight, a weight per square foot. 
And since we're intimately working with geometries here, we need to transform that into a depth value in order to get, because what we're looking for in this step is that HB, the, the actual physical depth, the actual height and feet of the, uh, of the flat roof snow load, or as, as it's referred to, the balanced snow load. So thankfully this is fairly simple if you just think about the units. HB is just going to be equal to PG. Uh, actually, that would be PF, sorry. PF divided by gamma. That's just going to be equal to PF divided by gamma. That's all it is. That will give you the dimension. It's the flat roof snow load. Because And think if you want to uh, think about how this works, uh, PF, again, is your flat roof snow load or your balanced snow load. Um, and think about what units that has. That has units of pounds per square foot. And gamma, our calculated density that we got from step one, is going to have units of pounds per cubic foot. So if we multiply by the reciprocal, pounds per foot squared times the foot cubed over pounds, square feet cancel out, the pounds cancel out, and we're left with simply feet. So we need to actually calculate the height that represents, that corresponds to our um, PF value. Our, that corresponds, but, but we have our, basically we have our specific gravity. We know the overall actual uh, area loading of the uh, flat roof snow load. And we need to turn that into a assumed depth of snow, which will then, we will then reference this HP dimension to get all of our other uh, drift dimensions as we move forward. All right, looks like the board is full again. So I'll again use my wonderful magic powers to clean the board off. I am clearly a wizard. In actuality, I play a 12th level warlock in our current campaign. <laughs> anyway, that's neither here nor there. Okay, so we've gone through the first two steps, determining the, uh, we've uh, determined the depth of the balanced snow load and also our specific gravity. And now in step three, we need to determine H sub C. And this is, just going, this is going to be just a simple subtraction. Reference the drawing we looked at before. Uh, determine H sub C, again, this is the difference in height. Um, this is the different, in, this is the change in height. Actually, you know, I'll just draw it out. We have our balanced snow load here, HB, and this is H sub C. So we're looking for this distance here. And that's a simple subtraction at this point because all because we uh, before we start calculating our uh, drift loading, we already know the difference in height between the upper and the lower roofs. So HC is simply equal to the uh, difference in roof height minus HB. Again, it's simply the distance from the top, the upper surface of the balanced snow load uh, to the upper roof. Okay, so that step is fairly simple. Uh, our next step is going to be to determine if the uh, roof surcharge in other words, the drift calculation is even necessary. Uh, determine if surcharge is necessary. Uh, is needed. And there's a simple rule in the ASC 7 to determine this. All we do is apply uh, this relationship. So what we do is, it's a simple if condition. Uh, if our h sub c over h sub b is less than 0 0.2, then uh, no surcharge needed. And let's draw that out uh, on the next panel. So you take the, uh, so once you have your h sub, uh, sub c and h sub b calculated, you simply divide them and see if that's less than 0 0.2. If it's less than 0 0.2, then no surcharge or when no surcharge is needed, which means you don't need to calculate uh, your drift geometry because you're not going to have to model a drift. So what does that actually look like? Well, that looks like, if you think about what this ratio would mean, it would mean um, something like this. Because remember, H sub C is not the total distance. It's just the difference in distance. So if you had a system, a situation like this, Imagine you had a situation like this, 
where you had an upper roof and a lower roof. I, think what, I just want to illustrate what this would look like physically. So if you had a condition where, uh, let's say you had, you, you'd have to have a relatively large H sub B, or maybe, maybe the difference between the roof heights is just relatively small. So let's say the uh, snow, you, based on your flat roof snow load, you calculate that the, that the level, snow uh, level uh, height is going to go almost all the way up to the, up to the level of the upper roof. In this case, H, this here again, this is HC. This is your HB. So here, HC over HB would be very small, and it doesn't make sense to have to really consider a whole bunch of extra drift considerations when effectively the HB basically just goes all the way up to the upper surface of or to the upper roof surface. So if it, if you're in that regime, then H then ASCE seven says okay, that's fine. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, you can if you uh, now you can if you want. It doesn't say you can't, but uh, it's not necessary unless you uh, really want to. All right, and here we go again. Ta da! Anyway. That gag is uh, getting quite old, I imagine. Okay, anyway. So our next step is going to be to calculate uh, the drift height. And this is gonna be the most complex step that we look at in the entire uh, snow drift calculation process. So we're gonna have one procedure. We're gonna, we need to calculate values for the leeward case and the windward case. And if you need to remember what those are, right there. Um, so we need to remember, we, we're going to calculate the, uh, the height that we would get for the uh, leeward case and for the windward case, and then we're going to compare them and use one of them in design. So our step five is going to be to determine the uh, drift height. And this is going to be our H sub D. Uh, in other words, our H sub D. Now, a uh, couple things. Uh, first, we're going to, uh, as I mentioned, we have a leeward case and a windward case. And I'm going to look at the leeward case first. So leeward case, everything I'm describing here only applies to the leeward case. So let's first look at the leeward case, and then after this, we'll look at calculating the height for the windward case. All right, so first of all, we apply a rule. So this is going to be based on um, the uh, PG and the uh, and the uh, the LU, which is the upper, uh, upper roof dimension. However, we first need to do a check on our LU. If uh, LU again, which is the upper roof length away from the intercept, uh, the, away from the change in elevation between the upper and lower roof. If this is less than or equal to 20 feet, just use LU equals 20 feet. You just go ahead and use the uh, reduced dimension. And then uh, you to actually determine the, uh, to determine the actual HD dimension, there's a couple of things you can do. There, well, there's precisely a couple. There's two things you can do. Uh, one, if you like charts and uh, if you like uh, graphs, you can use figure uh, 7.6-1 in ASCE uh, 716. 7.6-1. I can manage to write the number six properly. 7.6-1. Uh, That's one way you can do it. Or you can just do what I prefer to do, which is to just use the equation um, that is built right into, uh, that, that's actually used to create those plots. Um, I like to automate things, and you can't automate something with a computer method if you're using a chart. So if I ever have a case where I can eliminate the use of a chart, I'm going to do that. Now, unfortunately, we can't do that when calculating our PGs, our um, ground level snow loads. Um, although you probably can, like, there's probably some way to automate that referencing some database somewhere. But um, anyway, if you want to automate this, all you need to do is apply the following wonderful equation. Too many markers. Okay. And the equation is as follows. And again, this is just a wonderful, wonderful equation. So we have HD 
the depth of our drift, the upper depth, is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, we're going to have 0 0.43, actually, let's do it like this, 0 0.43, and this equation is listed in the code as well, so you can check that out if you'd like, and that's going to be times the cubed root of LU um, times the fourth root of PG plus 10. This is an equation only its mother could love. And then this whole thing minus 1.5. Then a bracket around the entire thing. And then this times, this whole big bracket, times the square root of IS, which is the snow importance factor. Uh, so again, we have 0 0.43, and that's not to the third. That Actually, let me just put some parentheses around that. It's 0 0.43 times the cubed root of LU, L sub U, which is the upper roof length, times the fourth root of, um, times the fourth root of PG plus 10, and then every, all of this here, all of this product here, minus 1.5. And then that whole kit and caboodle uh, times the square root of the snow importance factor, which we saw how to determine in a previous video. Lovely. Isn't this lovely? Oh, and one other note. Uh, note. Your final value on this uh, needs to be less than or equal to 0 0.6 times LU, the length of the upper roof portion. So if you have a, uh, so if you go and get this calculation and determine a value, say your LU is like 100 feet, if you go and determine your calculation shows that the height of the drift is 60 feet, which would be an incredibly tall drift, um, let's say you calculate it was 70 feet, an incredibly tall drift, um, you would reduce that to 0.6 times that or 60 feet. But that's neither here nor there. So just an upper limit um, for cases where, the only case that will generally apply is where you have um, at probably a very short LU value. And uh, in case you're wondering where an equation like this came from, this does not come from base principles. You can't really derive this from just basic fluid mechanics or something. Rather, this is clearly an empirical equation that comes from uh, various research uh, papers. Okay, however, in considering this, there are a few things we need to be aware of. Uh, notice uh, there are constants in here. There's this 10, there's this 1.5, there's this 0.43. This is an empirical equation. Therefore, we need to be very careful about what units we're putting in this. And uh, so if you are using metric, you'll want to build in some unit conversions into here. This HD, this is in feet. Uh, PG here is in uh, pounds per square foot. And LU is also in feet. This is an empirical equation built for English units. So you'll have to adjust accordingly if you're using um, uh, non-freedom units like the rest of the heathen world does or something. <laughs> anyway. All right, so that is calculating HD for the case of uh, the leeward uh, wind direction. Okay. Next, let's look at the windward case. So we're still on step five, determining uh, drift height, HD. We've calculated the leeward case. Now we need to consider the windward case. So uh, let's look at the windward case. I think that's an Ian e M. Banks novel, Look to the Windward, but uh, anyway. Um, so we're going to modify things a little bit here. It's gonna be it's gonna be very similar to the other calculation, but with some slight modifications. Um, so first of all, uh, you'd go and say, okay, point one, instead of using LU, we're going to use, uh, use the length of lower roof as LU. So wherever you see LU, we're going to use, uh, in any equation or chart that we see uh, LU, we're going to use the lower roof length. The, the length from the dimension from the change in height, the, the cliff for lack of a better word, and the end of the lower roof. Uh, two, we're going to, uh, and then we're going to uh, feed that 
we're going to get HD uh, by applying either the same figure, uh, figure 7.6-1, or the same equation. And I would give you an equation number, but that doesn't actually have an equation. It's just this equation is included in the ref in just in the uh, citation or not the citation, the uh, caption for figure 7.6-1. But if you actually work through it, you'll see that uh, you can actually map it. If, if you don't believe me, test the uh, test this out by putting some numbers in there and see if they correspond to what you would get in the graph. Okay. Then um, we're going to do one final thing on this. It turns out this equation is a little too great, is a little too large, or produces results that are a little too large for the windward case. So we're going to uh, reduce whatever we get from this equation by 25%. Uh, reduce calculated uh, HD by 25%. In other words, for example, um, uh, let's see. Uh, so if our results, either from the chart, either from the chart or from, uh, or from the equation, told us that HD was equal to four feet, we would then reduce that to an HD equal to three feet. Okay, so we now have uh, values for both the upper and for the not upper and lower, but the leeward and the windward case. And now we're going to look at how to proceed beyond HD. Anyway, um, after, so we now have uh, two HD values, one for a uh, leeward case and one for the windward case. And we're not going to actually design according to both of them. We need, we need actually just one thing we're going to design for because the wind can come from either direction at the same location. So we're basically just going to take the worst case. So uh, the final HD is going to be, uh, the final HD is simply going to be the larger one. Uh, if I were to express this pseudo-mathematically, I could say this is the, uh, the final HD is the greater of uh, maybe HD uh, windward, uh, HD leeward. You simply take the larger of the two. And then we have two more steps. Uh, this, the next one is going to be determine uh, our actual drift width. So we have the height of our drift, our HD. Now we need to find the width of it, how far from the wall it actually extends. Let's write that. I guess this is still part of step five, I suppose. But step six is going to be to determine uh, drift width W. Drift width, which again is W. And to do this, we're going to have essentially a series of if statements. Well, yeah, a couple of if statements. So anyone who's done some programming is going to absolutely love this. You can essentially collapse the language in the relevant sections of ASU 7 down to a couple if statements. And uh, let's see, first of all, you need to have, again, you need to have all your dimensions first, all of your dimensions other than W. And so we have our HD, our HC, etc. So if HD uh, is less than or equal to HC, in other words, if the calculated drift height is below the upper level, of the level of the up elevation of the upper roof, then W is going to be equal to 4HD. Simply 4 times our uh, our surcharge height. And then if HD uh, is greater than HC, we do two things. First, we have uh, another calculation for W. And in this case, W is going to equal 4HD squared Uh, 4 HD squared divided by HC. However, they have put an upper limit on this of less than or equal to eight times HC. And again, as far as where all of this comes from, this is just coming from 
uh, various research, these empirical, that's where these, these are basically empirical equations that come out of the literature. And, you know, people have spent a whole lot of time. I'm sure there's several professors out there who've made their careers studying snow load, and this is the result of it. Although I'm not quite sure, I'd have to look in the references when exactly that research was conducted. I'm not quite sure of the whole history of it, but um, considering ASC7 has been around for, and its protogen, and its uh, ancestors has been around for quite a while, um, the people who came up with this research may still be around, or they may not, they, they may not uh, be at all, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so in the case where HD is greater than HC, and I want to put an arrow to make clear that these are connected. And, and again, you only do this for the case where it's greater. And you set uh, H, uh, let's see, and reduce, uh, reduce HD to HC. So you still use the, so in other words, this is the case where the drift, calculated drift uh, ele, uh, height is higher than the elevation of the roof above it. So you're still going to use that HD calculation value for calculating your width. However, uh, you, after you've calculated that, you reduce your HD to HC. You're saying that basically they say, the specification is saying, AC7 is saying that uh, you need to use that higher value when calculating how far the drift extends uh, from the wall. But in terms of its actual elevation, it's not going to stick up above the height of the upper uh, above the height of the upper roof because you're already going to be applying a uniform uh, balanced snow load to that. Okay, and then um, we have and then there's one other consideration related to both of these. Uh, if W your predicted width W uh, is greater than the lower roof length. Well, let's look at this and let's say you had something like this with your, so there's the roofs and you have your uniform uh, load. And let's say the, the thing, the building actually ended here. Um, if W was longer, if your calculated W is longer than the length of this lower roof, you're saying you're gonna have a snowdrift like that, which of course is physically impossible because the end of it is gonna fall off. So, in, and with this, again, this dimension here is HD. So if you're in this case where W is greater than the lower roof uh, length, then what you do is you keep the same HD value, the difference between, and again, the HD is from the balanced snow load to the upper value that you calculate. What you do is you reduce this to something more like this. So you have, you have your, uh, your balanced snow load, you have your HD upper value, here, HD, oh, I just have to lean down and write that. That's not working out too well. Terrible handwriting and trying to write at awkward angles. So you have your HD here from here to here. And what you're going to do is you're just going to say, okay, you know what, more realistically, it's going to be zero at this far end. So we're going to set it to zero at the far end of the lower wall and just draw a line on the depth from the uh, HD value all the way to our, um, to zero at the, to a zero surcharge at the edge of our roof. Now note, this doesn't mean the snow load is zero at the end of the roof. This just means that the surcharge, the additional load beyond the, uh, the additional snow depth beyond the uh, flat roof snow load, that is, there is no, that is, that is zero. There is no additional snow load beyond the flat roof snow load at the end, at the end uh, or edge of the lower roof. All right, and there's gonna be one final step after this and we will look at that now. All right, so we have all our geometries and now we just need to turn this into an actual load diagram. So we have our geometries, so, or maybe that's not clear. Uh, think about what we've calculated so far. Um, so let me just write this step seven as determine load diagram. For, and this is going to be our design snowdrift. Uh, and this is what you'll actually then go and put into your various structural analyses, um, apply load combinations to, etc. 
So I recommend you just plot out the final load diagrams, really get a, a feel for what's going on. But remember, what do we have before we do this? Before we have our, ge uh, our geometric terms. We have our geometry. We have HB, the balanced snow load depth. We have HD, the drift dimension. We calculated that. We have the width W, um, and we have various lengths, etc. However, those are just dimensions. But ultimately, as structural engineers, what we care about is loads and forces. So um, what we're going to do is, I'm just going to plot this really quickly as a uh, load diagram. So we have our upper roof and our lower roof. And if you think about the loads on this, first we have our uniform load that applies, that, that will apply to the entire flat roof and also up top. But I'm just looking at the lower roof right now. And this again is our PF or our balance load. We have PF here. And we have an additional load, the additional surcharge. And thankfully, this isn't actually too hard to calculate. Well, actually, backing up a bit, we have our load. And it is important on the load diagram to have. Let me go ahead and put some additional arrows on this to indicate that these are forces, or area loads. And if I want, uh, if I'm going to actually do any kind of statics on this, I would need the dimension. I would need at least one dimension, and that would be the width of that. So you probably want to include that in the load diagram. And we have that, our W. However, I, ha I have this HC value, the dimension of, of, I have an HC value, or sorry, an HD value, which is the depth of the snow. However, I need to go and actually translate that into a load. So what I need is a, I don't need a, if I'm doing a load diagram, what I need is a, uh, a peak load, or P, a PD value for peak load. And what this is going to be equal to is, this is fairly straightforward, this is simply equal to HD, times gamma. And if you want to think about how that works, HD, uh, remember, is a dimension. So if we have HD times gamma, well, HD is going to be units in uh, units of length and specifically in feet, and gamma is going to be in units of pounds per cubic foot. And if you multiply those together, HD will have, well, you'll, you'll end up with units of pounds per square foot or PSF. And that is what we expect. All of our force, our, all of our uh, P values here, these are, they have the variable P fundamentally because they're pressures. And so they're force per unit area. And again, if you want to then go and um, turn these into line loads, well, what, what you would then do is say, okay, well, how far does this actually, does this wall actually extend into the page? Like if I can draw a crude 3D diagram, something like that. It's crudely drawn even for me. <laughs> um, so you'd want to use this, I don't know what kind of variable you'd give this, maybe D for depth, and you would then, um, you would have to multiply each of these. If I wanted to get, to, for example, a W sub F, which would be a linear line load along this, I would just multiply PF times D. And that would give me a pounds per foot along the lower roof uh, for the uniform load. And this, I could do the same thing for the uh, upper value for the drift load, and then just multiply again by the dimension into the page of the building in order to get the uh, a line load, if that's what you're looking for. But anyway, I'm not going to go into too far into statics here. This is just, uh, this video is just meant to be a quick introduction. Well, <laughs> quick by, by some of my standards, I suppose. Um, I don't know, I suppose it actually wasn't quick at all. But anyway, <laughs> this was meant just to be a, uh, let's not say quick, let's say long form discussion of how you calculate surcharge loads for uh, drift loads on two flat roofs of uh, differing elevations. And in the next video, we're going to do work through a long form example of actually calculating these with some numbers. That'll do it for now. Let me know if you have any questions. And as always, thank you.